I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker. He is the founder and CEO of Global Custom Commerce, and they are a direct marketing and technology company with tools to sell and service hard to buy configurable products and services. And believe me, their tools work very well. I'm a customer myself. One of their company-owned websites, blinds.com, is the industry leader. They have about two-thirds of the online blind market and did over 200 million last year in sales. Jay was born in, new, in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey, and he spent his early life in Rutherford, New Jersey. His family moved here to Dallas when he was 11. And like many successful entrepreneurs, and Jay is definitely that, he displayed an early interest in business, started several ventures in high school, including one selling custom t-shirts. If you fast forward to 2004, he supplanted nobrainerblinds.com and blindswholesale.com with the website blinds.com. And, uh, and of course, that became a tremendous success. They got quick recognition, were named one of the internet's fastest growing e-tailers by internet retailer in 2005. He created and maintains a business model that encourages associates to adhere to four core values. And these are things I think will strike a chord with many of us. Improve continuously, experiment without fear of failure, be yourself and speak up, and enjoy the ride. So you gotta have fun while you're doing it. Sometimes the ride's better than the destination, as we all know. In any case, uh, Blinds.com has a very strong corporate culture. It's been recognized by Houston's best and brightest uh, companies to work for in the medium business category. So let me tell you how I first met Jay um, over email. Um, I've been a customer of Blinds.com with my other business for some time. And one Friday night, I got a marketing email from this guy, from Jay, asking for feedback on a purchase I made. Said, tell me anything you can to improve the experience or the product. So I fired off a quick email to him about the valences that come with his two inch wood blinds. He immediately got back to me, addressed my question in about five minutes, and it started an interaction that lasted for an hour or so of emails. And I was blown away. This is a Friday night that the CEO of a company that's as big as Jay's and has as many customers as he has would take the time to correspond with me like he did. So I looked him up and found out who he was, and I thought, wow, this is a guy we need at our conference. So please help me welcome Jay Steinfeld to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Mark. Obviously, I don't have much of a life Friday night. Good morning. Last night I was in my hotel room and I was watching some old Wheel of Fortune shows. You guys know Wheel of Fortune? Yeah. So I noticed there was this one puzzle that I couldn't solve, yet almost all the letters were there except for one. So how can I not get this? Well, I realized that maybe there are some analogies to that show and what was, I'm gonna talk about today. That one thing, that one thing that's so important to build a business that thing that caused my business to grow faster than any other, more profitable than any other in the blinds business, that helped me sell the company ultimately at a valuation far beyond anything I ever believed I'd be able to do. And I'm gonna tell you what that one thing is in a little while. <laughs> so there's a few things that, have, that you can look at on the surface, the other letters that are very uh, apparent. Our growth rate's high. We, obviously, we were bought by a $100 billion company, which is amazing to me. Of course, being in Home Depot now and seeing how these decisions are made in these large organizations, I wonder how that ever happened. <laughs> you guys work for large companies? Yeah, so how is it possible that that many people approve this thing? Best place to work in Texas, best place to work in Houston, 
many, many things, American Marketing Association, Marketer of the Year, all sorts of clear, clear um, uh, accolades. And now, uh, Mark, we're closer now to 300 million, which is boggles my mind. We're about 401 employees. So those are the, those are the easy things to see about our success. But I don't want to make this so much about business or metrics or things like that. I want to talk about that one thing. So we've got this really nice organization. It's bright, it's colorful, it's like a startup. Well, you really feel like we're a startup. Every day we're a startup. We're just getting started. It's a culture that is bright, open, lots of dialogue, but it wasn't always like that. It actually started more like this. It was a store in Houston called Laura's Draperies. My wife started it, and of course her name is Naomi. <laughs> so Naomi started it. I had just been fired from my job. That was fun. In fact, that's an interesting story, if I could digress for a second. Uh, I don't know if you guys have been involved in a, in a merger on one side or the other. I was doing the diligence for the company I was working for, and I was looking at the org chart post-merger, and I wasn't on it. <laughs> Wait a minute, something's wrong with that. Yeah, and a few days later, I was gone. So I needed something to do. What was I going to do? So I'm a CPA. I actually work for KPMG here in Dallas out of, out of college. And of course, being a CPA, that made me perfectly, perfectly uh, adept and skilled at becoming a drapery salesman. And I would never tell people that I was a CPA because, I mean, who wants a CPA to do their draperies? But I did it, and I'd done, from 1987, I went into the Laura's Draperies business, and I'd go to people's homes. Naomi would also be going to people's homes in our car. That building there, Laura's Draperies, is now a nail salon. It was 1,001 square feet, including the stock room, including the bathroom. And people would come in, they'd set up appointments, we would drive in our car and help them choose the best window covering. It was a seven day a week job. We'd go to all over Houston, which is a big city, like Dallas, and six days a week I'd be going to appointments, maybe three, four a day, and then on Sunday what would I do? I'd have to do all the paperwork for all the jobs that I had sold the rest of the week. I'm not complaining, we were doing over a million, million and a half dollars, and for a little drapery shop, that's, that's pretty good. So I was making a good living, but I wasn't building wealth, and I wasn't seeing my three children, and I wasn't seeing Naomi that much, but again, I'm not complaining, it was fine. So that was Laura's Draperies. In 19... 93, I read a little article. It talked about the information superhighway. Oh, ooh, that sounds good. The World Wide Web. What is that? I didn't even know what email was at the time, and most people didn't know what email was. This is the time, for those who can remember, when you turned on your computer, it would boot up and it made all those crazy sounds. You know, so it would do that, take about a minute for your computer to eventually get there. 1,500 baud modems, which means you would connect to the internet and if you wanted to load a photograph, it would load like this. It'd take about a minute for one picture to load. It would kind of go Do you remember that? It was best practice if you had a website if you could get your home page to load within 30 seconds, that was considered world class. Eventually it was, can you load your home page within 10 seconds? That was startling fast. So that's, that's it, Prodigy was, was uh, the big thing. AOL had just started. And all these companies you know about now, including Amazon, hadn't even started. But I started Laura's.com. Just an experiment, 
just a way to see if we could get more customers, more prospects to the store. So Laura's.com made sense, $1,500. And it was fun. I'm not techie at all. Well, probably better than most. But I can't even program anything. So I had this guy create a website for me. Again, $1,500, Laura's.com. And that was fine. The next year Amazon launches, it's 1994. They're selling books. I thought, whoa, you can sell stuff online? I wonder if you can sell blinds. So I talked to people. I'm thinking about selling blinds online. What do you think? And what do you think people said? You gotta be an idiot. Nobody is gonna buy a blind online. They're custom made. People can't touch them, they can't see them. They're not even sure that they wanna give you your credit card. This is at a time when banks wouldn't even tell you whether they could accept a transaction that was done online because they didn't know if it was a valid transaction when the customer wasn't present to sign it. But I thought, what the hell? I'll just give it a shot. It's just an experiment, it's just a marketing experiment. Did I have any idea what the internet was gonna become? No, there was no broadband. I had no idea. It was like running an ad in the Houston Chronicle, $1,500. But then, because of selling books, thinking you can sell blinds, I boosted it up to another website for $3,000. And as Mark said, we launched a website to make buying blinds and shades a no-brainer. And it was called No Brainer Blinds. NoBrainerBlinds.com. No -brainer the first website online to sell blinds. So we wrote, no-brainer blinds, the world's most popular and trusted online source for blinds. <laughs> it was. It was the only one. So we always wanted to do things to make us look bigger than we really were, like the blowfish. So another thing we did, you're looking at my house, because that's where you start e-commerce businesses, in that garage right there, right up there. So from that, from that house in Bel Air, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston, I launched No Brainer Blinds. But the address was 4815 Pine Street, that house. That sounds like a house. That doesn't sound like a big business. So I changed the address. No Brainer Blinds, One Brainer Tower, Bel Air, Texas. I got mailed to One Brainer Tower. It was awesome. And that's the time when people were writing checks. They still were not comfortable putting their uh, credit card information online. So I'm getting checks to One Brainer Tower. The mailman said, you can't make One Brainer Tower. I told him I'd already created my business card, so it was a little too late for that. <laughs> and I remember being in Atlanta at a conference. Maurice was sitting next to me, a competitor at the time. He had a, uh, an online um, e-commerce site in California, he said, Jay, one brainer tower, like how big is that? I said, Maurice, you'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so it was always about making us seem a little bit bigger than we were, maybe, maybe a lot bigger. But it was fun, no brainer blinds, a little irreverent. I got the idea from a NPR car talk show. You guys familiar with car talk on NPR? You know that? Anybody know that? Raise your hand. Yeah, okay, so you know that. These guys are MIT engineers who started a, a, uh, a car repair store, and they took calls on how to solve things. The guys were brilliant, hilarious, funny, and used to send in to them a uh, puzzle. They'd have a puzzle, you'd send in the answer, and you'd send it to Puzzler Tower in Boston, Tech, in Boston, Massachusetts. So I got the idea from Car Talk that I would have this no-brainer blinds that would be a little irreverent, but really knowledgeable, and we would have one-brainer tower, just like Puzzler Tower. Uh, the colors that I used for no-brainer blinds were purple and orange. Why did I choose purple and orange? Because Federal Express was purple and orange, and their connotation was 
speed, credibility, fast, and that's what we were going to do because no-brainer blinds was going to be so easy that you could buy any blind, and we only had three, and they were only in white and off-white, and they were all made in, in one day or free, and it was guaranteed lowest price. I mean, it was a no-brainer. But the idea was to steal ideas, borrow ideas from as many people as I could. So it's really important not just to look at people within your industry, but to look at people throughout any industry, see what's working, and see what you can apply to your own business. And that's what I did. All the things that I did, even the, the order forms, everything, were done from competitors. I said, well, if they've spent all this time doing that, they must be good. So you started with that as a platform. And how did I take orders? I just had that, that store, and I'm in my car driving to appointments all day. So they would call into the store to Laura's Draperies, and we had a separate phone number, 888-4-NO-BRAINER. And they say, all of our customer service representatives are busy. We'll have somebody get back to you. Well, I was the only customer service representative. I was the only person that worked in the whole company. So they'd call me, and I'd be in my car. That phone, that's not me. And it's not my brother. My brother actually is here, Bobby. He lives in, in Dallas, and thank you for, for coming out. This is fun. In fact, I'm already having a great time. <laughs> so I used that phone, and I remember the first time somebody called. It was like in Ghostbusters. Where they said, we got one. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> They're waiting there forever, and finally somebody calls, and they rush in their car to get the ghost. So they said, there's a person from K Kansas that's interested in blinds. I thought, wow, that's awesome. So I'm driving my car. I pull off the side of the road on the freeway. I don't know if anybody is familiar with Houston, but there's something called the Southwest Freeway, or 59, and it's right in front of Lakewood Church, which used to be at the time where the Houston Rockets played, called the Summit. So I'm on this highway. I go, OK, I got to take this call right away. So I pull off the side. I'm on the freeway, just on the, side, on the outside lane. And I've got my order books. I've got my calculator. Remember, I'm a CPA, so I can use a calculator by touch. Order pads, all my samples right there. I take the phone call. I make a sale. It was like three vertical blinds. All incremental business. No overhead. It wasn't advertising at all. I was just trying to get, get my feet wet. But there's that call, and I made a sale. I said, i got to do that some more. This is great. It's all profit. And that's what I did for years. People would just call in. I'd pull off the side of the road. And from my car, actually a van, I'd answer calls. I'd make sales. Eventually, I had too many calls. And I had to hire somebody, which means I needed to get an office. So our office was actually that. Now, it wasn't that we were working outside. But at the back, right there, that's a door. At the end of this alley, I notice it's called Two Brainer Tower. So every time we've moved to a different location, we increase a successive number of Brainer Tower. We're now at our eighth location, and it's eight Brainer Tower. We've got this picture somewhere in the, in the office. It says, Billion Brainer Tower. We do think big. So we have to go through this alley to get to the office. It was 800 square feet. Anne and Sharon, my first two employees. And they're still working for me today, which is pretty awesome. They would answer all the calls. Now I'm doing my full-time Laura's Drapery thing, and they're taking all the phone calls. And that was, that was great. And for a number of years, for five years, that's what we did. Those two people, with me still in my car doing Laura's Draperies, no-brainer blinds, Ann and Sharon, from the alley. 
It's 2001 now. Eight years after I had started online, but really five years after I was selling things online at no, for no-brainer blinds. I was doing a million and a half dollars online with those two people. And how much was I doing in Laura's? A million and a half. How much was I working online? Four or five hours a week. How much was I working in my store? Like all the time? That didn't make any sense. So I sold the stores and went full time online in 2001. This is when I bought a, a, my, had my first acquisition of a company called Blinds Wholesale in St. Augustine, Florida. Went to his place, Joe, Joe Meem, in St. Augustine. He was also doing it out of his house. He was ready to call it quits. I bought it. So now he was doing, actually at the time, three million while I'm doing a million and a half. So that got me to four and a half million. That's 2001. Then we did nine million, then 12 million, 15 million the next year. Bought another company of 18 million. That got us up to 33 million. Got up to 45 a few years after that. Bought another company, got us to 70. And then organically have just built the company up to, we'll probably do between 250 and 300 million this year. Two thirds of all online sales by us. So this is far beyond anything I ever thought I could do. So 2001, I'm online. Things are going great. But my wife, Naomi, had been sick for four years. In the following year, in 2002, she passed away. We'd been married almost 27 years. We had three children. I just launched this business. What I thought was a great life turned out to be a horrible life. I was pretty much devastated, as you can imagine. I had to make some decisions what I was going to do next. How am I going to even get up? How do I maintain my optimism? Asking my questions, existential questions like, what's important? How do you define success? How do you define happiness? What makes you tick? What are your core values? What is important to you? And unfortunately, it was, took the death of my wife to start asking these questions. And I was asking, I was reading books on psychology, reading books on happiness, neuroscience, philosophy, religion. And I still read those kinds of books. They're still my favorite book. Because I want to understand myself as well as I could. And it took a trip. Uh, we, we did replicate the alley in our office. So you got, there's the alley. Hold on. There's the real alley, and there's the real alley in our office. That's, in, that's indoors. <laughs> so it took a trip to Alaska for me to start really understanding what was important. And on that cruise in Alaska, I realized that there were a couple of things that were important. But as it turned out, only one of those two things really was important. Because as I went through my journey of self-discovery and introspection, it changed. And I'm not going to go through the whole evolution of how I came to where I am today. But I knew that when I thought pioneering was something I wanted to do, it wasn't true. It was really more about experimenting and just trying new things. After all, I started online. I had no idea what that was. It was totally ambiguous. And I had no idea what, what I could ever amount to with, with online business. Nobody did. So today, there actually are core, four core values, as Mark said. And the first one actually has evolved from improve continuously to evolve continuously. Evolve is better than improve, because you can improve. But evolve has something a little bit more visceral to it. And it's about adapting to what you need to do in order to survive, if not thrive. 
So we evolve continuously. Now, everybody wants to get better, right? Everybody's got the will to improve, but you got to ask yourself when you're hiring people and you look at them, how many people have the will to do what's necessary to improve? Not as many. So what are those things you do to improve? Well, the first thing we look for when we're hiring people, are these people already doing things in their personal lives to get better? In a professional life, fine. You go to conferences, you read, you read books on, on business, you keep up with the latest technology. You got to do that or you're, you're out of business. Well, is this person taking cooking classes? What is this person doing in their lives to prove to me that they already have not just a propensity to get better, but they've got the behavior to show they want to get better at things? Because if you don't already have that within you, you're not going to feel comfortable in an organization that is evolving not once a year as you set your goals for the next year, but every day and throughout the day. Evolving is a continuous process, and that means during the day you get better at something or you help somebody else get better. So your goal is to evolve and have everybody around your sphere of influence to get better. That's the most important one, evolve continuously. The second is to experiment without fear of failure. Now you say, well, Jay, you're an entrepreneur, so you like to take risks. I don't like to take risks. Well, I don't like to take risks either. I am risk averse. All right, so how do you say experiment without fear, but you don't like to take risks? Any ideas how that works? Small experiments, lots of small experiments. I never bet the farm. I'll never do anything that could sink the ship, whatever analogy you want to use because I'm afraid of doing that. But I'm not afraid of looking at the downside risk of every decision I make. And if I can live with that, there is no risk. Maybe it's money, maybe it's time. But if you can live with any result from an experiment, it's really not that, that much of a, of a problem. Just do it, and do it as many times as you can. Now, you don't want to fail. It's not like you go in hoping you're going to fail. You want to succeed every time, and you always give it an educated guess or based on data as to what you should be doing. But as long as you're experimenting, uh, McKinsey's got a study that shows that when you look at the organizational health, they've got a, it's called OHI, Organizational Health Index, one of the key variables of the health of an organization is how rapidly they experiment how often they experiment. And if they don't, they're going to be stagnant. Think about your own business, your own self. How often do you experiment? What kind of culture do you have that allows you or doesn't allow you to experiment? What do you say to somebody within your organization when they try something and it didn't work? Do you say something like, well, that was stupid? Or do you say, I'm really glad you tried that. What did you learn from that? And make a big deal about it in front of other people. Bill just tried this, this uh, experiment with our supply chain. We thought it was a great idea. It didn't work. We learned this and this. I want to commend Bill for taking the chance to do that. Creating an organizational environment that allows people to experiment is up to you. And it can be done. You just have to be clear with your intentions that it's okay to do it. But even more than okay, you've got to insist that people experiment. The third thing is, when you want to make a decision, what do you need? Data, facts. How do you get facts? Well, you observe, you read, you look, and you ask questions, and you get information from the people who are closer to customers, from the people who are closer to what, whatever the task is within the organization. Because you cannot possibly have enough data to make a decision. So you have to encourage your associates to bring up everything they know so that you can make the best decisions possible. 
Ultimately, of course, you want them to make all the decisions. And when you get to a certain size, that's the only way it's going to happen, other than strategy and direction. So we say, you are unique. You come from a unique perspective, whether it be your age, whether it be your sex, whether it be your place of origin. And because of that, you're going to look at every problem differently than anyone else in the company. So when you get a diverse opinion from diverse perspectives, you've got way more data points. So when we say be yourself, it's about don't try to tell us what you think we need to hear, or what you think we want to hear, but what we need to hear. And just make sure you listen, because what you're not trying to do is get buy-in from people. You really want information to make the best decision. Fourth one, and I don't know why you can't have fun at work. I think you can. We do. We enjoy ourselves. And it's not because we have ping pong tables and lava lamps and shuffleboard and we eat cake and we celebrate all the time. I mean, yeah, we do that. But when we work hard, really hard, and we achieve things, that's fun. I was talking to the conductor of the Houston Symphony about uh, four or five months ago, and I noticed they were playing this one piece that was, seemed the, very syncopated, really hard, and all the musicians were concentrating. You could see it was a very difficult piece and trying to get that syncopation exactly right. And I asked him, seems like they were just working so hard. Don't they like to have fun? He said, our orchestra had more fun playing that piece because of the intensity they had to put into it and because of the effort to practice and get to the state where they were. And that's where we are. When we work really hard and we achieve things that we've never done before and we become better, that's fun. Yeah, we have some relief with the shuffleboard and we've got a, it's not Mortal Kombat, there's another big game right now. We're having a video tournament today, the finals are today. So we do that stuff too. But those four things, evolve continuously, experiment without fear of failure, be yourself and speak up, and have fun. When you have a culture like that, what happens? Everybody's getting better. Everybody's helping everybody else get better. We're helping our vendors get better. We're helping the company get better. We're helping our customers get better. When everything is getting better, you don't have to tell people what to do because they're always looking to get better. And that's been our secret, understanding who we are, what makes us tick, what are the important things when we wake up, what do we want to do? What do we just automatically do? What's in our DNA? These four core values are not goals. We don't strive to do this. This is what we do. We wake up and this is what we do. This is what I do, which is why I'm still at the company after four years, because I get a chance to live my core values at a level way beyond anything I've ever had to do. Ultimately, it gets to your purpose, and our purpose is to help people become better than what they ever believe possible. Help people become better than what they ever believe possible. It doesn't mean you help people achieve more, we're not talking about helping people achieve more. We want them to become better people. As a result of being at Global Custom Commerce, our people become better people. We have a, a uh, uh, the ILLiad, the Institute for Learning, Innovation, Advancement, and Development. It's our in-house learning center. 
It's to help leaders become better leaders. It's help people who are not yet leaders become leaders. We have blueprints for their careers to make sure we understand what their goals are and help them do that. And we help people live our core values. When you've got an organization where people are becoming the best they can be, they then can achieve the best they ever have been able to do. And therefore, revenue goes up at 20, 25% a year. Profit gets higher and higher every year because that's just an automatic life occurrence for us. And what's really awesome is if you do this and you walk away from your business for a couple of days, then you might come back to your business in two days with this. When I wake up, well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who wakes up next to you. When I go out, yeah, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who goes along with you. If I get drunk, well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who gets drunk next to you. And if I heaver, yeah, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who's havering to you. But I would walk by. I'm going to be the man who's working hard for you. And when the money comes in for the work I do, I'll pass almost every penny on to you. When I come home, I, come home, oh, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who comes back home to you. And if I broke, well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who's going over you. But I would walk 500 miles. I'm gonna be the man who's lonely without you And when I'm dreaming Well, I know I'm gonna dream I'm gonna dream about the time when I'm with you When I go out, when I go out Well, I know I'm gonna be I'm gonna be the man who goes along with you And when I come home, when I come home Yes, I know I'm gonna be I'm gonna be the man who comes back home with you I'm gonna be the man who's coming home So understand yourself, really understand what makes you tick, know what makes the business tick, make sure you hire those people who are already like that, that match your core values, and when you do that, your business will be worth way more than it, you ever believe possible. Thank you very much.
Do you want to take questions? Did I want to take questions? Yes, I do. Yes. Um, did they do that on their own, or was that, did they just? I had no idea they were going to do that. I just showed up, and they said, we've got. They said, hey, we've you know, been wasting some time, and we want to show you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yep. We live in a political environment which is basically, which is based on uh, zero sum thinking. If I have more, the only way I can get that is if you have less, and and so on. I'd like your thoughts about that because uh, that's been a sub theme in this conference in the last couple of days. Well, I'm not going to. The question is uh, zero sum game. Uh, are you asking? how it applies in, in the business and how, how can you make everybody better without having the competition between people? No, so, no, I, mean, I know you're not asking me a political question, right? <laughs> it's where, how do you, so my father, who never voted for a Democrat his whole life, told me at a young age that the purpose of business is to make society a better place. That's the purpose of capitalism. And that's stuck in my craw because, you know, as a college student, and the, and the question then is? So the question is, how do you take the principles that you have employed to build a really successful business and, and, and ensure that it gets? So how, how do you propagate this idea of making the whole organization better? Well, you, there's always this balance between individualism and the greater good. We say that when everybody is better, that's great. We expect you to get better. There's a high expectation. During the first week of training and orientation, I spend an hour with them talking about these four core values, how they came about, and why we expect you to continue to get better. And people will look and see that people who are in the organization for five, 10 years, sometimes are no longer there because they did not rise with the tide. We will make those decisions, but we will also help people and coach people to become better. It's not just up or out, it's we want everybody to be up, but if you're not, you will be out. We're serious about high standards. We're serious about evolving continuously, and that goes for our people. But we also say we want you to make other people better. So I don't know if that specifically answers your question, but if everybody has a responsibility to get better and to make everybody around them get better and to make your department better, I think it's pretty clear that we're all getting better. Yes? Two, two questions. Why am I still here after selling the business four, four years ago? As you probably know, most founders, entrepreneurs, they sell their business to some company, they make money, and then they don't like the man <laughs> telling them what to do. Uh, I'm still there because, one, we're hitting our numbers, so they want me to be there. Got to always hit your numbers. But I have an opportunity to evolve at a rate much higher than I was able to do on my own. It's because I'm living these core values. I have to get better and better. I have to speak up a lot. I have a direct line to the CEO, the CFO. I can talk to them anytime and frequently do. I'm working on projects for Home Depot far beyond anything I've ever done with blinds. So I still have an opportunity to be significant to make large contributions, we believe we're going to transform retail. I believe I'm going to be part of a team and part of the Home Depot team to transform retail. In blinds, we are beating Amazon. And we're going to do that with other product categories as well. So if you like that kind of thing, why would I not want to do it? What else am I going to do? Fly fish? Well, yes, I am. 
but I'm going to fly fish and I'm going to do this. And as long as I get to keep fly fishing and be with my grandkids and be with my wife and travel a lot and do that, I mean, it's a good gig. It's a, it's a great deal. The next question was, what about the culture? Obviously, we have a very deliberately crafted culture. And it's, it's something that is near and dear to us. And what is the culture of Home Depot? Well, the way I look at it, have, are you familiar with the book, The Five Love Languages? I think Gary Chapman is the author. Talks about everybody's got their own definition of love. Some people think it's about words of affirmation. Some believe it's gifts. You have different definitions. And if you actually are married or have been married and you said, hey, I love you, obviously. I did the dishes for you and I did the wash. And then your spouse says, yeah, what have you gotten me some lately? It's just a different thing. You have to know the love languages. And in business, I think there's three love languages. One is customer intimacy, which we are. Two is operational efficiency. And the third is product technology. I would be like Apple. Home Depot is operational efficiency. We know Home Depot's love language is operational efficiency. Not that Home Depot doesn't care about customers. You have to be. You do $108 billion, you're pretty much thinking about customers a lot. Stocks at an all-time high. They're not doing anything really wrong. But we start from customer intimacy. Home Depot starts from operational efficiency. And as long as we understand where the two are and where we're coming from, we don't have to say they don't understand it. They don't understand us. We just accept it. We accept them for who they are. We've learned how to be more operationally efficient. I've learned so much in four years. And I also think from that, if I go back four years as to who I was and how capable or incapable I was four years ago and think, could I lead the organization today if I was the person from four years ago? The answer is no. I've had to evolve, and I will continue to evolve. And as long as I've got the ability to evolve and to do these cool things with a lot of money behind us, 2,200 stores, I mean, why, who wouldn't do that? Not just 400. We have 400,000 associates. So that's, that's the answer. Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you. So how do you continue to evolve and, and have a business that's that large but still answer an email from a random you know, customer on a Friday night? And my second part of that question would be, talk to us just a little bit about the system that you have to get that client feedback and how you sort through all that data. I'll answer the second question first. There's a lot of ways. You can do the sur surveys and all the things. We do all those things. But we have found this one question that we ask every customer 30 days after they buy. Tell us one thing we could do better. We don't send out a whole bunch of questions. Now, we do what's called the net promoter score. We do that also. But every customer gets, tell us one thing we could have done with our product, our service, our process the website, anything. And we get a lot of people who respond to that. Now, the ones that I respond to, I actually don't respond to everyone, but we do have responses to everyone. But if it's a problem, I'm going to see it. If it's a personal one that they say, hey, I know Jay, I know you, or, or something, I'm always going to see those. They will give me those types. The ones that just say, um, I need a, a new balance or something. And there's people who will answer those routinely. So I don't look at every single one. But if there's a problem, I'm going to see it. If there's something personal about it, I'm going to see it. And of course, our associates are on the phone. We're asking them to speak up and tell us what they see. So we're going to get a lot of data from our, from our customers. We track all the calls that are coming in. We have disposition codes on those so that we know every call that comes in, why did we get that call? We try to get to the root cause of every problem, keep digging deeper, 
Why weren't they trained right? Is it a person problem? Is it a system problem? Get to root causes. To eliminate, we really want to eliminate the problems, right? It's fine to be able to answer questions, but you want fewer questions. Mark, did you have something else you were going to ask? question is, what advice do I have for buyers and sellers of businesses on a merger? Because as you know, most fail. The first thing is, you've got to understand why, if you're buying a company, why are you buying them? And you need to know that before you actually close. And you need to decide what you're going to do and have a game plan prior to closing on the transaction. The craziest thing is people buy companies, and they go, we bought them because we wanted market share. And then you said, so now what? And who are we going to assign to this? All this stuff has to be done months before closing. You've got to, it's the preparation for the integration. And then you need to have the acquiree understand what that game plan is. A lot of times, the acquirer doesn't let the acquiree in on the game plan. So you're being thrown around. You have no idea what's going on. You don't understand what's important, what isn't important. You got to think that through and have it nailed down in advance and include the company that you're acquiring in that plan. Are we going to be streamlining? Are we going to be improving market share? Are we going to be merging you in? They need to know that because they'll never cooperate. And eventually, people will be scared, and they'll start leaving. So it's about inclusion, having a game plan in advance, having enough people assigned to the merger that are outside the normal aspect of their job. If you have your job to do and to take in another company, something's only being done part time. So you need people whose job is only to handle that merger. That's it. So I really appreciate all the questions. Hopefully, you've become a little bit better than you were before. And if, if that's the case, then I feel I've been successful today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.